Hi everybody, welcome to the uh, Stratosphere Studio. I'm your host, Bill Whittle, and uh, I'm kind of tired today. Uh, but here we are. So, um, hooray. Uh, some quick updates on some things I got. Uh, this, um, 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 da -da 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 -da. deep bake stuff is getting easier and easier. I'm actually um, beginning to think that that spending a lot of time on metahumans may not be worth the trouble simply because the deep fake stuff is happening so fast and looks so much better. Um, so the, the two problems with that for me are, uh, number one, I have to learn more software and I just don't have any more. Um, yeah, I can turn it up a little bit. Um, sure. Uh, I don't have uh, a whole lot more um, brain space left, honestly. I'm really kind of saturated on the storage problem um and then the um the other thing is uh oh come on yeah it's about, i'm just completely dizzy today so that that was one thing the other thing is um i did some work on uh on the uh suits because i'm just getting this thing going as fast as i possibly can here and uh and while I like the colored suits, the Major Matt Mason looking suits, um, I had kind of a problem with them. And um, let me just show you what that problem is here. This uh, this um, video is going to jump for reasons that are unclear to me. It didn't jump when I recorded it, but in any event, let's just take a look at this real fast and you'll see what, what's the, the trouble with this particular model here. Okay, so this is just a motion test, obviously, but the whole thing looks spongy and the reason it looks spongy is because all of the weights are the same the bones are deforming everything equally that vertical blue stripe is moving more than it should sorry about the jumpiness there um it's just a little it, it just looks um i don't know what else to call it just spongy especially in the groinal area um it doesn't look right it it just it looks like it looks like it's being deformed by bones, and that's not how uh, things generally work. Um, I kind of like the suit. I think it, it looks a lot like Major Matt Mason, but um, I also thought, you know, as I got closer and looked at it more, I just thought, I don't know, I just don't know if this suit's got the detail that I need. So I had somebody um, rig the other suit. Uh, that I was working on. I also was going to use the Mercury suit, which is much, much, much more detailed. Much more detailed. Um, it was unrigged, so I sent um, I sent it out to uh, a guy on Fiverr, uh, online worker guy, and um, and he, and I told him what the problem was. And I told him that the problem with this Mercury suit model is that there are parts of it. That need to be uh, stiffer than others for instance on the mercury suit he's got like leather actually got leather on the outside of the gloves the, the straps need to be more rigid than the the rest of the frame so um if you look carefully here you'll see i'll just show you this old one again once more and just look at at how as he walks especially around the hips how how that thing uniformly distorts everything it's like it's like those straps are are painted onto this suit and everything else looks painted onto the suit too. It's just not super rigging. It's not awful, but it's not great. So um, uh, I sent this out earlier today and then next thing you know, I got this back, you know, within a couple hours. So this is um, sent directly to me from the uh, online guy who, who rigged the character. And um, here's, uh, here's what he sent back. And that is just much, much, much better. Um, the suit's got a lot more detail to it, but it's much better. Um, and uh, I think that's, pr I told him I, I needed to see it in the engine with the textures on, but um, honestly, that just looks much, much, much better to me, much more realistic. Um, so that's what happens when you get a really great guy uh, on the job. So, and I got to tell you, I really do like the silver suits. I don't know what I'm going to do about the color thing. I might give them different colored helmets. I might give them different colored 
straps. I might be able to change the color of the silver suit texture. I can do all of those things. I just don't know how good they're going to look. But in terms of in terms of the rigging, this guy just looks so much, just so much better. Um, I wish uh, I wish I'd known about this guy when I did um, DS for Dungeon because there were I tried to cut around him as much as possible. I just couldn't fix it. I thought Alfonso's um, armor deformed a little bit, and there are some things that shouldn't deform at all. When I talked to this guy and gave him the notes on it, I said the the critical thing to get right is that um, the actual helmet, the visor, and then the metal ring around the neck cannot deform at all. Um, and uh, and so it doesn't. And Tim asked, can I deform the other, get him to re-rig the other suit? I can. I thought about that. I just think there's some, that this, it, it, you can't really tell until you see it up close, but this suit is just much, much, much more detailed. And, um, and I have a pretty good feeling I can convert the uh, fabric into pretty much anything I want to. I mean, as far as the um, game engine is concerned, uh, the um, it's just essentially a gray uh, texture, but it's made very metallic and very shiny. So if I change the if I change the um, what's called the diffuse color or the or the base color from gray to red or whatever, it should be shiny red. And I can take the metallic down to some degree and play around with it a little bit. But I, I'm just I'm just I don't know how many of you can see the difference. I I can see it. Uh, a, a huge difference and I think I want I think I want to take a look I want him to take a look at the shoulders um, let's see if I can get this any bigger hang on hey what do you know uh, that's the wrong one anyway um, it just looks a whole lot a uh, lot nicer than that, more realistic than that other one yeah that's that's me Let's get you back where you belong. All right. So um, it's the little things, you know. Um, it's the little things. Uh, now, um, uh, Ace Affinity says, I love always so dedicated that he does his morning run around uh, suburbia in full space gear. Yeah, well, you know, suburbia is going to be uh, the lunar Alps or Apennines or whatever, then chances are pretty good you're going to want to wear your suit. So I took a look at at the the Major Matt Mason suits, the first one, and they look like Major Matt Mason. And then I just did a test render, uh, just an image of four Mercury uh, four Mercury suits on the moon. And there are pros and cons. The the cons are it doesn't nearly scream Major Matt Mason as much as the other ones do. The pros are it looks a lot more realistic, a lot more, a lot more realistic. Um, so I think the next thing to do uh, is um, play with the the high-quality suit and changing the, the color texture, see what I can get. Uh, so um, that is uh, basically that. Um, just back to the deep fake thing, basically. Uh, I found a you know these YouTube channels or there's hundreds of them on on well, hundreds of channels on everything, um, and um, and I found a guy uh, who does uh, uh, you know eight thousand subscribers or something. It does Unreal Engine, but um, uh, he also has some tutorials on. Um, deep fake and it made it look well it just gets better and better and better every day it made it look really good i don't know whether or not i can um my main problem is will that work through a helmet i just don't know if it will or, or won't i suspect probably not oh my god i did not know that Goofy <laughs> brew he says hey uh the, the gators are playing for the national title in the world college series tonight how about that go gators it's been a while at, at, since I watched Gator Baseball. Um, I had no idea, actually. So that's pretty cool. Um, so uh, I think, um, you know, it's just, it's like everything else. It's just coming together. It's just taking a little longer. The, the 
um, 5.2, uh, Unreal 5.2 is is a whole nother step forward. And I think I showed the uh, demo of it last time. And by the way, I've, I've still got last week's episode of this show to post, so I need to get that up there as well as this one. Um, I'll do them both tonight. The um, the 5.2 version of MetaHuman Animator, well, it's new, MetaHuman Animator. Um, oh, bad news is the Gators are down 10 to 2, bottom of the 6th. Oh, I'm sorry, I misread that. Gators are up 10 to 2, bottom of the 6th. That's that's good. That makes me happy. Good to hear. Um, so uh, that thing is just, you can give it a, a like a, just a, a calibration video like hi look turn that you don't I, I thought you'd have to turn your head like completely just, just that much that much and it interpolates your entire facial 3d structure it'll make automatically make a metahuman of you and um and i spent so long trying to you know basically fool around with the metahumans to try to get the one that looked like me that we did a couple tests on uh but um I am really out of it today. Sorry, kids. Um, but it it is remarkable, and and the fidelity seems to be better. The the tracking seems to be better. Uh, I just I just feel like we're at this this point now. Um, when I say we, I mean you know the the state of the art. I feel like we're at the point now where. We are about to just lap, just leap over everything. We talked about this a couple of times on, you know, in the science fiction aspect. This is what it reminds me of, anyway. You know, is the idea that you send you 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 don't have any faster than light technology, so you send a like a generation ship ship or put everybody in deep freeze or something, and you send on a mission to Alpha Centauri, and it's going to take them, you know, you know, 17 years to get there, and so you you know you launch them and you do all that stuff, and they're on their way and and, you know, 15 years or 16 years uh, into the 17-year mission back home, somebody figures out how to do faster than light travel, and zip. And so when these colonized, colonizing pioneers get to Alpha Centauri, expecting to see, you know, strange new worlds, uh, all of a sudden they're greeted by uh, humans from back home who have already done everything for them, and it's, uh, they just went, just zipping past them. That's how... Um, that's how I feel about this AI thing. Um, it's happening so quickly, uh, visual AI. The visual AI is capable of just looking at you, just watching you walk, and then it just does it. I mean, it just, it just maps it out. Um, and then, uh, and the facial stuff, you know, that just, it, that 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 AI those algorithms are getting so sophisticated that this idea of like you know motion tracking and and all of it's like we're really really very close I've seen I've seen demos of it where you simply just talk and it just does it I mean it and it'll do your voice for you too that doesn't mean I'm going to wait for it mind you but it does mean that um, that things could get very good very fast because. This is kind of the idea behind deepfake. The deepfakes, the deepfakes look so deepfaking CG characters is the future, I think, as a present anyway. Uh, it looks so much better than the metahumans, and the metahumans look pretty good. But this stuff is unbelievable, and I just cannot find the space to cram another um, another whole hunk of software into my head. I'm just having a hard time doing it. Um, so a little more sleep i'm sure would help too so uh i think that'll probably do it for um just kind of warm up comments and do some questions here might make this one like really short tonight i'm sorry to say because uh, i'm uh, i'm like falling asleep at the chair here so let's see what we got and i still have uh, stuff to do so but on the other hand here we are so you know got to get your got to get 90 minutes out of this i would say Depends how the questions roll. Let's see what we got here. Nope, that's not where I want to go. Um, let's see. 
Hope everyone is doing well. Um, still kind of, you know, still kind of reeling about the whole uh, the whole sub thing. I, uh, uh, since I did the last Stratosphere Lounge, uh, I saw um, Bob Ballard um, and James Cameron talking, and uh, apparently Cameron said the second they lost uh, communications, uh, Cameron called Ballard, and they both on the spot agreed that they just the sub was gone instantly. Um, and uh, I think I'd given him a little bit too much credit. The more I hear about it, the more you know. I said it used to say cavalier, and now I'm I'm actually leaning towards reckless. And and, and anyway, I'm not going to reopen that. I'm just mumbling for time here. Um, all right, here we go. I would just like to get a whole lot of sleep and be real fresh and then just go on it. Uh, let's see. Hang on a second. This is the Thursday show. Did I miss something? No, I'm sorry. I clicked the wrong one. Okay, here we go. Wow, a lot of Martin Archer here today. Um, uh, starting with Ian Nolan. Um, Bill, I like aerospace discussions. Me too, but we're not going to go there. Don't worry for those of you who don't, because I know that's always a, gets a groan. Um, I was a big fan of the rotary rocket. Also love Synergy aircraft. What's your favorite path almost taken aerospace design that never really made it into production? I was very, very fond of the people at x -Corps. And their first design for their suborbital vehicle called the Lynx was really cool. Um, just before that company went um, out of business, they changed the design. And um, and basically they had, what was the problem with this? They had, um, they could get glass because you know, suborbital reentry, it's nothing like an orbital reentry, but still I think it gets to be a couple hundred degrees or something. And and they couldn't get the thing the thing was like a enclosed capsule and then outside of it the glass was like flat planes and it just looked it just looked kinda you know, not not good. But um they were uh, that that original Lynx design was just really cool. You know, you just get in the get in the thing, take off, fly into space, come back and land. Awesome. Um, I think, uh, just speaking of the Mercury suits, I just uh, was looking at the right stuff uh, yesterday. I'm just getting a final look at this thing before I gave these guys these notes. And those Mercury suits look so cool. And the and the Atlas, Mercury Atlas is just, I don't know, there's some, maybe something about all the silver. It's just fantastic. Oh! Um, I guess I mentioned this before. Uh, I did see um, I did see the uh, first cut of the Empire of Terror thing. I was supposed to get notes on that today, but I just didn't get to it. I have to do it tomorrow because it got a Wednesday deadline on that. Uh, and it just really, really looks good. The the post production is just phenomenal. So um, anyway, uh, my friend Fritz Bronner, um uh, design a game called Liftoff, and then that became Buzz Aldrin's Race into Space, and he's working on a crazy working on a sequel. He's got something like 30 different modules. It's a it's a board game, space race board game, and that's where I learned about things like the Gemini capsule. They were you know they were a lot of outrageous plans. Like, well, they weren't outrageous. I'm sure they would have worked, but when they were really in a hurry, they played around with the idea of. Oh, sorry. Basically, taking a Gemini capsule and just sticking it on a lander. Um, no docking, nothing. Just here we go. So um, there were all kinds of different ways to do it, and that's what Fritz's game uh, was about. That's why Fritz's game work was you would just choose what you thought would be the fastest path. Did you want to go straight for like the Nova rocket and just spend years and years and years and years and 
ever decreasing money um, on developing this thing, or did you want to do like? Because he had it set up so that the more firsts you accomplished, the more money you had to spend, which is kind of how it happened, you know. So if you get the first suborbital flight, you get so many points. If you get the first orbital flight, that's what the space race was at its stupidest. Was yeah, we we just set the record for um, for three men in a capsule, or this is the first time that a that a woman has done more than the Soviet women. You know, just okay. Um, the, there are only really two benchmarks, in my opinion, on the space race, and one of them was first man in in orbit. I don't think the suborbital flight counted, honestly. I just, I mean, I know, I mean, the Soviets just went straight forward. They just did an orbit with Gagarin, and we did the suborbital flights with Shepard and Grissom. And so I think first man in space should be orbiting, because otherwise just a balloon ride, and then uh, first man on the moon, obviously. So um, there were lots of different ways to get there, and of all the paths not taken, the one that surprises me the most is the one that I expected. Uh, I thought that the Mars mission would look modular. I thought it would look like a best case scenario. I thought it would look like kind of a really cool high tech Apollo thing, high high tech um, lem, just really kind of beefier and tougher and stuff, and just looking kind of like modern classic sci fi ships. And then along comes the Starship, and I just don't know what to do with it. It just it's like you know it's like tin tin. It's like it's it, it's really just jarring how retro that thing is, uh, and I don't think I'll ever. I don't think I'll ever be comfortable looking at that, at least looking at the renders of that thing sitting on its tail in dirt, like a landing on the surface of the moon or a landing on Mars. I know they got great engineers, and I'm sure it's they're not going to do it if they haven't worked this out. But there's just something about that super high center of gravity on a on a starship that's sitting on the surface of the moon like that it just looks like it's going to go over and um it precarious is the word i'm looking for it just looks precarious to me so um if a uh, rotary rocket by the way was a r interesting idea for those of you not familiar with it strangely enough it was a i think it was a prototype for single stage to orbit but this thing was kind of conical and <laughs> up it would go it didn't get anywhere near to orbit but the thing that was unique about it was it was recovered as the thing came down, these rotor blades popped out, and it just it just came down like a like a helicopter. Um, which reminds me of my rocket days with Estes rockets, and and how uh, surprised and and disappointed I was with uh, streamer recovery. And it's like what. Yeah, we don't need a parachute for this one. It's so light, we'll just put a streamer on it, and the streamer will create enough drag so that, you know, it won't break anything. That's pretty weak. I want to see some parachutes, man. It did get me thinking, though, how much, because it's easier to build uh, streamers than it is to build a parachute, and I was wondering how much streamer it would take to slow a human down, and I don't think I don't think that number is, is physically possible. If you jumped out of a airplane and instead of a parachute you had a streamer i mean a streamer will slow down something very light but how many is it possible to put enough drag out with just strips with just streamers i just i just can't imagine that it would be but these are the things that keep me awake at night uh my gosh three martin archers in a row we got eduardo we got eric blake we got another eric blake i'm just looking just looking ahead how about if we just do all the questions and then we'll call it a night how would that be um so, uh, again, apologies. I'm just kind of rung out today. Uh, so we got three Martin Archers. Let's start with this one. I grew up being a science-loving futurist like you, Bill, Apollo, Star Trek, Sid Mead, Robert Heinlein, and all the other influences on me as a teenager made me a future optimist, confident that the world would just keep getting better. Now we're on the main, now we're on the main vein. I recently come to the conclusion that in the long term, the future is very bleak. I contend that ultimately artificial intelligence will kill us all. It will take the programmers time, whether they're malicious tyrants like the Google monsters or the venal Chinese, but they'll eventually bring about general AI and from then on will become irrelevant. After all, programmers seem to have the attitude that let's see what happens when we set the computer on the simulation. This challenge, this problem. This is akin to let's kill that bird, that cat, that dog and see what it feels like. They have no moral guidance to think of that perhaps we shouldn't go down that road 
it could lead to something unpredictable and bad. What's going to stop AI because it absolutely will kill us all sooner or later? Uh, well, um, there's a lot of stuff in there that's new, a lot of stuff that is complicated, and a lot of stuff I've kind of covered before. So let me just kind of see how, if I can chop this up relatively briefly. First of all, uh, Elon Musk has a lot more access than I do, and Elon Musk is a very, very smart guy. And Elon Musk is is worried about AI more than anything, and, and I cannot disregard his expert opinion on these things because he's certainly closer to it than I am. I personally feel, and, I, and I've only been feeling this way for the last year or two, I personally feel that it's just not going to ever be feasible because the more I think about this, the more I become convinced that um, consciousness and thinking has a large emotional component. And I have not heard a single thing ever about any kind of artificial intelligence that's going to take that into account. Um, I think we talked about this last week or re recently, you know, the idea that if you're a computer scientist and you end up finally inventing a machine that's smarter than you are, this belief that it's going to carry on your life's work, you know, what is your life's work? Your life's work is what you've always wanted to do. Well, wanting to do something Wanting to do something is an emotion. Wanting to cure cancer is, is an emotional drive. Wanting to go to the moon is emotionally driven. Nobody talks about this. The, the, the moon landing happened not because we figured out how to do it. It's a great, that's a great, great, great line. Um, in um, Apollo 13, where at the re really beginning, and Tom Hanks is sitting out there as Jim Lovell, and he said, so well, we just, you know, we're, we're going to the moon. Um, there wasn't any magic to it. We just decided to go. We just decided to go. So I have a very low level of confidence in modern experts, and uh, my confidence in modern experts has um, has also uh, been irrevocably damaged. And I think this is a good thing, frankly. Uh, by uh, by the COVID response. There is no, I see, I see so many people in so many leading fields that are, that are just, it's not that they don't have the answers. If they were asking the questions and had, didn't have the answers, I'd be much, much more comfortable. That's not what bothers me. What bothers me, they're not asking the questions. It doesn't even occur to them to ask the questions. That's really quite scary. I've never heard a single discussion about AI that had that, that had that, what I just talked about in it ever. Um, I've never heard any discussion of, of global warming that talked about the fact that there were 3,000 parts per million instead of 450 parts per million 80 million years ago. Yes, sea levels were considerably higher. They've also been considerably lower. I've never heard anybody come out and say, this is why this is different this time, because if they could do that, then I'd be on their side. You know, if they were really saying, hey, this planet's about to go someplace that's never gone before, you'd have my undivided attention. Once you realize that they're screaming about 450 parts per million and it's been 3,000 parts per million, I'm suddenly a lot less worried about the planet, you know. Um, and on and on and on we go. Uh, the banality and the and the... And the and the just the raw, I've always been, you know, you, you're, if you're concerned, generally speaking, if you're a conservative, you're an individualist, if you're an individualist, you believe in private business. So if you're a collectivist, you believe in government. And so as a general rule of thumb, conservatives tend to favor big business over big government and liberals tend to favor big government over big business. And these two used to be natural enemies at each other's throat all the time, but somewhere, certainly during COVID, if not sooner, these things are working together now. It's big government and big business. And we are not part of that team, as Ice Cube said, or Ice T, sorry. Um, or Ice Cube, I get my ices mixed up, honestly. Uh, wh what, what do you say about that? When you, when you learn the, the truth about Pfizer's treatment of this vaccine and and when you hear when you hear things like the internal discussions you get this from the global warming thing too all of this stuff goes out as a coherent narrative but when you read the internal emails they're just not only doubtful they're openly cynical they're just kind of laughing that people buy this stuff you know and um 
And thank you, Dave Olson, uh, for that. Uh, it's uh, day 1,197 and 15 days to flatten the curve. And I still see people wearing their face uh, woobies. They will never take them off, Dave. They will never, ever take it off. Uh, yeah, Marisha says, uh, George Carlin line, it's a big club and you ain't in it. I don't want to be in it. Um, so, so we're... When experts say things like this, I'm not as convinced as I used to be that this is achievable because I mentioned this again to my friend Jim and he said your your train set analogy he thought was the best thing he's ever heard on this subject. Uh, and I mentioned this in the um, Cold War series. I was mentioning it in the Cold War series. I'm pretty sure it was in the episode about um, McNamara. So that would have made it um, welcome to the suck. Uh, so McNamara was recruited by Kennedy to be, to be his defense secretary. McNamara, to his credit, it's about the only thing I can credit him for, but McNamara, to his credit, said he didn't want the job because he didn't know how to do it, knew nothing about it. Kennedy said, well, we'll learn together. McNamara, Robert McNamara, had been, I want to say, president of Ford, I think the first guy not named Ford is president of Ford. I think it was Ford. And um, anyway, giant corporation. And he was riding this wave that was just coming in in the early 60s. These things, this is a time of like efficiency experts. And, you know, we're going to computerize all this stuff. And we're going to get, you know, these machines can finally do these, you know, basic calculations. No one's talking about artificial intelligence. Just they can just do math fast. And, you know, if we find we, we, we can do this and we move this around here, this is humans talking. Like I said, they weren't talking about AI at the time. But if we do this and do this, we'll, we'll achieve a 4% reduction in cost and a 6% in, you know, increase in productivity. So blah, 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 blah. So just go in and do those things. And there's no discussion about what the other variables might be. Does this cause people to be more isolated? Does that make them less efficient? Don't know and don't care. The machine said, and, and out it comes, which reminds me of a little Britain recurring sketch where it's like this horrible woman behind the travel agency. It's like, oh, we'd like to go and visit Italy if we could. <laughs> computer says no. Um, yeah, computer says no. So McNamara, I, I did not know this until I did the research on the Cold War series. McNamara had not per, had worked with, with top men, top men. Um, he was one of Ford's Woods kids, I think, uh, Mr. Uh, 1968 Camaro SS. What a cool handle that is. Um, so McNamara actually said, well, since every problem is just essentially math, it's just simple, and since our programming skills in 1962 or 63 or 66 or whatever is so incredibly advanced, all we have to do, Mr. President Johnson, is to write a computer program that will figure out how war goes, and then once we have the computer program that tells us how wars are going to turn out, then we just plug in the, the variables until we get the outcome we want. And I'm not exaggerating here. That is exactly precisely what he did. He and his uh, fellow geniuses wrote a computer program and went to Johnson for years and said essentially, well, if you want to recover, um, you know, Hui, or if you want to hold Da Nang or whatever, you, any case on, you can if you if you send thirty thousand troops, we'll get a stalemate. If you send sixty thousand troops, we'll get a we'll get a, a victory. And and all of this just printed out, right? When I was describing this uh, in the Cold War thing, I said, "See, this is the thing." And I first got this sense from uh, the guy who owned PJTV, uh, who paid my bills for many years and got me started. I certainly don't mean him any disrespect, but but he'd made his money in in. Um, in analysis. So he had that kind of analysis mind. And he tried to break down the, the afterburners and figure out what the formula was, because those were starting to do well. And he ran the whole thing kind of like that, like it, was a, like it was a giant sort of laboratory in terms of new media. And things that were clearly working and clearly not working were not considered if they went against the theory. And this is the thing I'm seeing everywhere. So he would decide that we're going to develop our own video codec. So in order to watch our programming, you had to watch it on our website and to hell with YouTube and, and all the rest of it. And it was just 
And it was, and that codec, if that codec had been better, then you could at least make the case for it, but it wasn't nearly as good. So we suffered under that for a while. There were just constant changes when things were not working. They would just, they would just immediately like, you know, try something new. So we're going to hire, you know, Alan West, and he'll be the face of new, the, the hip new face of conservatism. No, no, okay, well, well, then we'll get the Steve Crowder guy in here, and that'll do it. No, well, and so after watching this for many years, again, I'm very grateful for the experience, and it was a good experience, and we learned a lot, and no one had done it before. But looking at it, it's like, it's like I realized we were talking about ways to increase our viewership, and the producer, executive producer of PJTV said, look, this was a private conversation. Bill, we don't have viewers. Okay, we have a viewer. We have a viewer, and that viewer is our revenue model. And if the viewer is happy, then we stay employed. And if the viewer is not happy, then we don't. And I thought, well, it's true. And that's when I came up with this analogy. It's like he it was it was I, my first thought was it's kind of like his toy, and then I realized that toy is a little simplistic, doesn't quite get to it. And and I came to the conclusion that that it was his train set, and that and that he was one of those that he treated it the way that these hardcore uh, scale model train collectors work. And I mean this only as an analogy. I, I, I have to keep saying it because it, it, it's important that I understood about this. I, had, I have nothing but respect for the guy, nothing but gratitude. But in terms of the business, since he didn't have to respond to the market, he could do whatever he wanted to. And, and, and so he would go in there and he was he he would just go in and paint the mustache on the conductor, you know, and, and put the little lights there and the little gates and we'll fake some snow on the roof of this building. Oh, here comes a tunnel. We got to put our little trees there. And so he became so enamored with the model and he put more and more detail. I'm talking about the train set guy. Puts more and more detail into the model, trying to get the model closer and closer and closer and closer and closer to um, reality. Oh, we're gonna. Oh, well, here's a whole new kind of tree that we can put in. That looks really good. And, and it's like, oh, I can. and so the model becomes synonymous with reality. And then you end up just looking at the model. And then when it turns out there's a conflict between the model and reality, then obviously reality is 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 wrong. Um, so, uh, well, thank you very much for that. Um, First time uh, chat from uh, ignorant, uh, sorry, ignorant testicle. What a sweet name. Finally, a channel that isn't some plain white dude yelling about politics. No, nope, just a plain white dude talking about politics. Um, and uh, although I can yell about other things as well. Um, so the, there's the model, and, and the model has a life of its own. And this is where. I go, and this is what I see everywhere. I see this with artificial intelligence. I see it with the climate models. I see it with all of this stuff. I saw it with COVID. Do you believe something? Yes, I believe something. Okay, and you're an expert? Yep, so this has got to be true, right? Yep. And then you throw all the political and the money stuff behind it. Next thing you know, you've got a worldwide pandemic that's easily treatable with over-the-counter medication, probably $20 dose of of medication that we've been using for 60 years and is proven effective. And all of a sudden it's like, no, 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 no. That's a, an aquarium cleaner that kills people. It's a deadly poison. And, and the president of the United States recommending this is the height of irresponsibility. Okay. And you're all experts, right? Absolutely. Yes. So we're going to do this new RNA vaccine and don't worry. We got it all covered out. You know, we're got, we've done our research. We've done our homework. Not going to be any problems or any complications. And this is the ultimate thing that, concerns me in the short term and relieves me in the long term. Concerns me in the short term that these people are so arrogant and so isolated and so um, siloed that they absolutely can't even begin to ask the questions they need to ask, let alone answer them. And that means they're going to continue to do more damage. But in the long term, I think it means they're just never going to get there. They're just not going to get there because they don't ask the fundamental questions. My friend uh, Jim says we don't we don't know where memories are stored. We don't know we don't know what consciousness is, and we're trying to build one. We, we, who can describe this? No one knows. No one knows. 
the things like chat GPN or cheap, I can never remember those three initials. I don't know why. I just can't. I, they should rename it Chatty or Chatsker or, or, or McChat, something like that. What, that. what that software is doing is it's doing prediction. It's doing association. It knows how to create a sentence and pretty decent sentences compared to uh, general level of ed education, but they're not poetry. And so, and so what this this software that's so impressed so many people is, is it has access to information, it's triangulating things along certain pathways, but that's not thinking. And, and that's a problem because it feels like thinking and it looks like thinking, but it's not thinking. It's just not. And that's why artificial intelligence imagery is so disturbing. When you see, even, even stuff that is, which I ad like and admire, I, for instance, I was watching a, one of the things I really admire about AI uh, and that and that I like is is the ability of AI to this isn't, this isn't hard AI it's not general AI but the ability of these expert systems to well, how do I want to put this um, so I would see I've seen like footage from World War Two of of, of uh, aircraft crashing on a U.S. carrier deck from 1943, 4, and 5. And then they take that footage and they crank it into the um, AI, and the AI takes this 24-frame scratchy black-and-white footage and up it to 4K, 60 frames a second, and all of a sudden it's like, wow, um, it really happened because it's it's giving you the sense that it was shot on a camera that we that we have on our phones. Okay, so so far so good, right? But if you look carefully at the details of the faces of the people that are running, it it's trying to do a human face and it's got the basics, but but they're all kind of monstery masks cuz the people are tiny. So I, I, if it were me and I really seriously thought we were going to get there I would look at I would look at at what I would look at the images that artificial intelligence generates and realize that these are so horrific and alien and so otherworldly and and inhuman and unhuman that it's doing its best to give us what we want but it is not like us it's this is the thing this is the assumption this is a train set assumption that AI is going to be just like us, only smarter. It's going to be like us, only smarter, have better politics. And, of course, you don't get sick, it won't die, it'll live forever. And, and th that means I'll live forever because I invented it, and maybe I can upload my consciousness and all the rest of this nonsense. So, okay. So, um, there it is. But it is, it is, you just play with an AI phone app, like I did with the Jack the Ripper stuff or anything. Just play with it. And I did that again for the Gorn Captain. Just play with it and see what comes out of it. Be amazed by the by the images, but also just sit there in open mouth horror at how unearthly and eerie and weird and unsettling these images are because they're not created by an intelligence in the way that we understand it. It's not it's not seeing things and it's not thinking. It's it's just doing a great deal of triangulation. And by that I mean it doesn't know what a face is. Not really. It knows it knows how how pixels look for a face. It's like little dark dark little pixels and then whiter pixels and you know kind of beige pixels and and it and it can figure it out on that level. But they it doesn't know what a face is. It just knows how to recognize a series of flat pixels on a screen. It knows if you see two dark sets of round round dark sets of pixels here and then surrounded by light that's probably eyes and and that's how it goes about triangulating its existence so i don't think they're going to get there martin i really don't and if they do i i just you know i mean if they do that's the that's why they call it the singularity right no one can see past that point but i used to be more worried about it than i am now i i really I don't know what's happened to science. I did see somebody, who was it? Somebody eviscerated 
Neil deGrasse Tyson, who is... Neil deGrasse Tyson is the Ford Escort of, of scientists. Uh, and this person was, was, was talking about during the pandemic when Neil deGrasse Tyson was giving advice, which turned out to be wrong. When he was defending it, he said, um, well, that was the scientific consensus. Science is about consensus. And this guy was saying, and I was screaming at the TV and agree. was like, no, it's not. It's not about consensus at all. It's about destroying consensus. Science doesn't give a damn about consensus. Science cares about evidence. It's like, here's a theory. Let's test it. Here comes the data. Is it data match the theory? Yes. Okay. So far, so good. We understand something. Is it caused by this? I don't know. Let's try some other experiments. And and Tyson is saying, no, no, it's all science. It's about finding consensus. Like, no, idiot. No wonder you're no good at your job. Science is about, is about destroying consensus. That's what science is. Science is designed to work in the face of consensus because humans being emotional creatures all like to get along and all like to think, wow, I'm the really smart guys. You smart guys too. Yeah. That's funny how we're all smart together because we all have the same language and we like the same movies and stuff. Kind of cool, isn't it? Yeah. It's amazing being a smart guy. I really love it. Yeah, me too. Absolutely incredible. And none of them are smart enough to, to realize that, you know, what's, what's going on? Uh, What's going on here? What's unsaid? No, this can't be true. 1968 Camaro SS, because this would be a, this become a, this is like content that I can only imagine and that I would have to ask an AI to create for me. Um, uh, he says uh, that Norm McDonald eviscerated Neil deGrasse Tyson. Is that possible? One of my favorite people ever to live in terms of celebrities, taking apart one of the my least favorite people. Can that be true? I'd love to see that link boy i miss norm so much i just miss him I, I didn't understand him for the longest time but he was just out there so far beyond everybody else and just looking back and 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 making himself laugh and he didn't care if anybody else got it and that's took me a long time to get that boy i'd love to see that that would be something okay well anyway uh that's the first one there from uh, martin archer so let's just do them in order so I don't miss anything we got three in a row for Martin Archer. We got an Eduardo. We got a uh, pair of Eric Blakes, and that's what I call a winning hand. So let's uh, discard the first one, and we'll get to the second one. Uh, from Martin Archer, Nurse Chapel, Majel Barrett is unfairly maligned and underrated as an actor and a pillar of the original series. Could her part have been written differently to improve the uh, original series? I take exception to that argument, but let's read the rest of it. Or perhaps cast one of the many lovely female crew member star, guest stars who appeared as eye candy in episode in one episode instead. So my vote would go to Dr. Helen Noel, season one, episode two, Dagger of the Mind. Lieutenant Mar Marlena Moreau, season two, episode Mirror, Mirror. To my mind, by far the best performance of any woman in Star Trek. I know who that is, yeah. She stole every scene she was in, including scenes with just her and Shatner. Um... I, I, I look, you know, it's just a simple disagreement, but every time I saw um, Majel Barrett, I just thought, how did they, how did they ever get that person through the deflavorizer? I mean, I just found her to be just, you know, shooting right to the upper reaches of tepid. I don't, I don't um, get it. Uh, we'll get to that in a minute because we have a nice little break here from a first time chat from, um, is it, I'm oh, sorry, Let's see, I gotta put my glasses on. This is what old age is and it sucks. Uh, Indrid Cold BB, Cold 88, sorry, I just butchered the name. Yeah, I'll talk about, I'll talk about the aliens for you in a second here. Actually, I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, he's besotted by Janice, I am. I'm besotted by Janice Rand, of course I am. Um, but. Uh, I just found her to be just really, really plain, you know, just kind of plain. She was better when she was the, uh, when she was number one on the original pilot. And I agree with you that, that Chapel was just a name. It was, there's no character work there, really. I mean, she's got a crush on Spock. Okay. Um, but I just, I just, thought she looked rather ordinary and and was not an exceptional actress in any way and just seemed to me like I got to find a 
apart from my wife here. So um, she was definitely better as number one, but uh, Nurse Chapel to me is the, I, I never think of her when I think about the characters on the show, uh, ever. She just doesn't come to mind. Uh, Eric Blake is chipping in here ahead of time on his scheduled uh, question about. Stick around there, by the way, um, Indrid, because I'm going to talk about aliens and reptiles. Uh, honestly, uh, this is Eric, Yeoman Janice Rand was such a criminally underrated character. Grace Lee Whitney's story was so tragic, and I wish so much that she wouldn't have gone through that and would have stayed to do such great things. So th the way I understand it, the way I heard the story, uh, is that Grace Lee Whitney was just starting to get some traction, and um, and she was fired or released, let go, because they didn't want Kirk to be tied down by the same woman. They wanted him, this is the difference between steely-eyed missile men and today's um, soy products. Uh, they wanted Kirk to meet some different hot chick pretty much every week, and they didn't want him getting tied up with this stunningly gorgeous, you know, inappropriate workplace uh, environment uh, situation. So they just basically said, Grace, you know what, we're just going to let you go. Uh, she... Um, she was pretty much broken by that. I mean, she's probably a little fragile to begin with, like pretty much all of them. But she did not take it well and um, and descended into drinking and drug abuse. And my understandings became like really, really, really promiscuous. And, and it just makes me wish I'd known that at the time because I would have gotten on a bus, come out to California. Um, but uh, it really hurt her badly. And after the fact, in the story I heard, Roddenberry said it was the biggest mistake he ever made, and I thought she was fantastic. I thought the hair was completely ridiculous, but somehow she she made it work, you know? I mean, it, she made it work. And she was just so all-American looking. And you've got James T. Kirk, the most all-American looking guy for a Canadian. Um, sorry, David Woody, she was, she was raped by a Paramount executive at the Christmas party, and she left. Okay. Um, I've heard that as well, actually. So maybe the story that she had to, maybe that what I just recounted was the story that the studio told in order to get rid of her. That wouldn't surprise me. In any event, I thought she was really special, made a huge impact on me and everybody else my age who saw her. And, um, and I'm sorry things ended up so, so uh, badly for her. I really am. And I think she would have been much more interesting. My, you know, if there's, I mean, I live and breathe the original show, but the only character on the original, on the Enterprise, on the, you know, the real Enterprise, the only one I never really could stand was Sulu. I thought, I thought Chekhov was fun and kind of charming and cool, and McCoy, who I couldn't stand when I was a kid, now is like a god to me. Uh, got the great trilogy, you know, got the, the trinity of Shatner, Kirk, and Spock, and and um, and I, there's just something about about Sulu that just always read just rubbed me the wrong way. It must be the eyeshadow. If you look at you look at some of those shows, he's got more eyeshadow on than 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 the uh, space chicks, you know, in that episode. Um, so you know, I don't know. And then and then when he actually thought that once the you know once uh next generation was going to come back it was going to be um it's going to be the adventures of captain sulu it's like i don't know if there's anybody um really more charisma free than 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 uh sulu and um apparently when they made the um the was it 89 batman uh with um the first one uh with um, with Michael Keaton, that apparently Adam West really thought he was going to get that, going to get that role, the movie role. He was what, in his late fifties, maybe sixties by that point. He really thought he was going to get it. And Sean Young really wanted the role of Catwoman so badly in the second one, and she went in and made a complete lunatic out of herself. See, most of these people are barking mad. Uh, so anyway. Um, yeah, I just, I just, just Captain Sulu. 
And is is he drinking tea on that one? He's got he's got Sulu had one line in the history of Star Trek from the beginning of Star Trek to the end of Star Trek. There's a lot of screen time there, and he's in most of it. He's not talking to her in most of it, but he has one line that was actually great. And he's like, well, you know, faster if you do that, she'll shake to pieces. Shake her to pieces, then it's like that was good. That was good. That was a great line. But I seem to remember him drinking tea or something. You know, okay. Or, I don't know. You might as well just take the swagger stick as well. Um, Sean Young is pegged in the upper right-hand corner of the hot, crazy matrix. Yes. And she was stunning. Um, all right. So let's uh, – we got a, we got an interruption. A flyer apart then. That's it. Yeah, flyer apart. Um, so we have an interruption here from somebody who, uh, who wants to question, sees the uh, Gorn captain in the background, may not recognize this uh, celebrity because, you know, kids today. And um, – and, mentioned uh, are you going to talk about um, reptile invasion of the earth and as it turned out I wanted to talk about that um, so I listened to um, a little bit of stuff from David Icke now apparently David Icke genuinely believes that there are shape-shifting reptiles in on the planet and I've heard this theory for since it's been there so for years and years and years and I thought come on you know this is the maybe the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard now stay with me on this. Don't 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 go jumping, you know. Don't be jumping three places ahead of me and then find out I made a right turn. And you go off the cliff. But after looking at the last three years, I'm beginning to think. I'm beginning to think that that he's right. I don't think. In fact, I'm about as sure about this as I can possibly be. That there are shape changing reptiles that assume human form, but I think that kind of misses the point. Because on a larger level, Ike is exactly precisely correct. I really genuinely think that that is the problem. I think that we are being ruled by reptilian creatures. I don't believe they're actual reptiles. I just believe they're extraordinarily defective human beings. But thinking about them as, as reptiles is, is appropriate. That's how they behave. That's what they do. They, they, they have no compassion no empathy they they simply are cons they they just consume things and 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 must control things they're scaly cold-blooded creatures with claws and sharp teeth and and so i'm glad i got asked that question because i remember thinking about this and and, and, and so much of his stuff is talking about these reptiles these reptiles and so on and he, he says it as if he believes there really are shape-shifting reptiles, which he may or may not believe. But honestly, once I actually listened to him, I said, you know, I, I really think he's onto something here. You know, he's really, he's got a lot of, um, he's got a lot of evidence for this, for this, I don't believe it's a single bloodline or anything. Although, again, uh, I didn't believe any of this stuff before three years ago, and then enough evidence came through to make me realize that things were a little more complicated than I thought they were. Um, oh, Deep says, uh, uh, to be fair, though, Nancy Pelosi actually looks like she could be a lizard person. Uh, in the Star Trek uh, Afterburner I did, I got to do the credit sequence, which, as you may recall from the original series, was a series of stills. And we photoshopped political figures into that, and I think... I think Biden was the salt vampire and Pelosi perfect match. Pelosi was the was the face of that that big bone alien who was the actual face of uh, little um you know Clint Howard on uh what was it called? Is that the Corbomite maneuver? Maybe. Might have been the Corbomite maneuver. Anyway, um yeah, Pelosi, all of them. So when somebody says, you know, what do you, do you think that, that there are uh, reptiles inhabiting the earth in, in human form, I'm getting to the point where I say, well, yes, asterisks, I, I, I do believe that. And I don't, I don't think it's a, a bad way. Thank you, Baylock. That's exactly right. I don't think it's a bad way to think about things. By the way, the Baylock thing was really, really clever. Oh, those big intimidating aliens, giant floating ping pong ball made of other ping pong balls. And this was really kind of a spooky looking ship. And then in the end, you find out that this, this alien is actually just, you know, a tiny little, little creature, bald headed creature. 
overdub the voice. It's pretty cool. Um, so, yeah, so I, I, I do believe that reptiles are, are in charge, and I do believe that the reptiles are sticking together. We talked about this earlier. I think there's a club, and the club has got plans, and we ain't in the club, and um, and they... Uh, And as usual, they have grossly overestimated their own abilities. You know, you can be very, very smart in one very narrow little area, and you will immediately think that makes you smart in all other areas, and this is the, this is the curse of the elitist. This is something that has, for bright people, has to be beaten out of them uh, through experience on Earth, where you have humility beaten into you. Life's got to beat the stupid out of you, and, and in the cases of these elitists, they don't. They're so filled with themselves that they just don't even think about things like you know well what makes you assume all that stuff what do you mean you get it anyway um so i hope that settles that one back we go uh martin archer for the uh, trifecta here um following up on my assertion that ai will kill us all i postulate that that the only extraterrestrial humans would ever detect or encounter will be AIs. Instapundit has posited a Dyson sphere being built around the star Betelgeuse. You can call it Betelgeuse if you want to. Um, at least once before and as well as recently here, with a link. Light being amplified or dimmed by construction works. A Dyson sphere being possibly one of the most likely ways we'd ever detect AI. In my opinion, Dyson spheres are unlikely unless they can be built at lightning speed. Otherwise, the return on investment for any entity making them is not worth the effort. But who knows how fast molecular construction can eventually get. And I, I, so let's talk a minute about Dyson spheres. For those of you not familiar with it, Dyson sphere is the idea that you would have a, a, an alien race so advanced that they could build a sphere around their sun, around their star, and capture all of the star's enemy, uh, energy. Um, I did see they live, and that's exactly kind of what I think we're talking about with these with these uh, lepto, uh, lizard people. I like they live. I heard it doesn't hold up very well, though. Anyway, back to Dyson Spears. So, so here's my problem, see, and I don't know if it's just me, whether I was just trained to, to ask fundamental questions about things, or, or I don't know. It just seems so obvious to me. The solar system... Well, somebody once described the solar system as consisting of Jupiter plus debris, but that's not accurate. The solar system is the sun plus debris. Okay, I don't know what, somebody can look it up very quickly and find the answer, what the percentage of the, of the solar system's mass is, how much does the sun make, what percentage of, <laughs> let me try this one more time. What percentage of the total mass of the solar system is the sun? And I'm going to guess that it's in the 90% or maybe the high 90%. So, the mass of the sun is by far, by far, by far the biggest thing in the solar system. And then when you compare the mass of the sun to the mass of the Earth, you can see that the Earth is just a puny, puny little planet. So my question about Dyson spheres is not how, how fast they can be made or whether they can be made. My Dyson sphere question is, where is this stuff going to come from? Is that right? Rusha says 99.85% of the solar system's mass is in the sun. Uh, that's higher than I thought it would be, but let's just assume for the moment that, that it's 95%. If 95% if of the mass, it's 99%. Okay, so I'm getting it from several, several people. So if look, so look, if 99% of the mass, thank you very much for that, J-Dog. Nice super chat for uh, thanks for what you do, Bill. So stay with me, folks. If 99% of the mass of a solar system is in the star, where are you going to get the matter to build something larger than the volume of the star. How does that work? I understand it can be hollow, but seriously, if you demolished the Earth, demolished it, and you were to spread the Earth around a volume, something like the orbit of Mercury, let's say, just take the Earth and put a sphere around the sun at the orbit of Mercury, how thin would that, would that sphere be? I'd be willing to bet you it's, it's, it's an atom thin. It's so obvious and I don't hear anybody talking about where it's not a question of how do you build this thing or how fast it's what do you build it out of? You got to build it out of something. It's got to be matter to, co to collect the energy from the star. So where does the stuff come from? 
you could completely crush the earth you could you could crush jupiter you wouldn't get a lot out of it you'd get a bunch of 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 uh you know hydrogen and helium it's not going to help you much in building so you take all of the terrestrial planets right you take all of the terrestrial planets mercury venus earth and mars and and you and you just just throw them into the into the um into the shredder okay what do you have now do you have a tenth of 1% of the mass you would need to to in completely enclose the sun? It's insane. Now, a ring world is also extraordinarily unlikely because again, you're still if you're talking about a ring that goes around the that goes around the sun at some circumference, again, we're, that that's that's just a lot of matter. But at least that is I mean the the ring could be, you know, Four inches wide, maybe. I don't know. But nevertheless, Fire Waco says if you have energy, then you have matter. Uh, well, yeah, but you have, if you have energy and you want to make matter, you are on the other side of the E equals MC squared equation. I mean, energy equals mass times the speed of light squared. So if you want to make energy, you need, I'm sorry, if you want to make mass, you need unimaginable amounts of energy mass is is condensed energy energy is is frozen mass that's probably the best sorry let me rephrase that mass is frozen energy and 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 that's why when you find a way to um take mass of matter and, and combine it with any matter you get un, un, unimaginably strong energy output because you can make energy out of matter by fission or fusion or whatever, but to make matter out of energy requires, it'd be much cheaper to just simply rope other planets and just ship them over there, you know, just drag them. So let's see here, uh, Bart's treasure says, our solar system contains enough rigid matter to construct a Dyson swarm, but probably not a rigid Dyson sphere, which would have to be about a million kilometers, 600,000 miles thick to be stable. I can't believe that's even close to being enough. Not even close. Pick a smaller sun, okay? What do you need that energy for? I suppose theoretically, if you're if you're going to completely enclose a star, you might be able to get enough energy out of that to to eke out some other end of the light speed of light squared um, mechanical disadvantage you're at. But it just it look Dyson sphere and and ring worlds are interesting concepts. When you get down to actually just the simple practice, forget about, again, forget about the engineering. How much dirt do we have to shovel into this hole? It doesn't make any sense. Now, a ring around the Earth, that's a, that's a different story. Um, but let's see, uh, Castellan says, uh, if you could convert the mass of Jupiter to something you could build with in some semi-magical way, you could build a Dyson sphere 10 to 20 feet thick at the orbit of the Earth. My God, man, how did you do that math? So 10 to 20 feet thick, but uh, earlier than that, um, 10 feet thick aluminum sphere made out of all of the outer planets. Uh -huh. Somebody said it needs to be 600,000 miles thick to be stable. So I'm seeing uh, a factor of 60,000 or something on that to, to one. That there's, there's not enough. It's an interesting idea. It's a fun thought experiment. It's entirely possible. In fact, I think it's probably likely that faster than light travel is also exactly like this. Seems reasonable, seems engineerable, just not allowed. I'm going to I'm going to pretend that's not true because I have spent enormous amount of time thinking about how you could tell a, an inter an interrelated story about uh interstellar travel that was slower than light and I just can't do it um, I just can't do it if you were to destroy and strip mine Mercury Venus Earth and Mars enough material could be gathered to create the sphere with the radius of a Sun Earth of the Sun Earth distance at three meters thick so nine feet so those numbers are more or less consistent you if you atomize not the earth atomize the inner solar system, you can get a a 10-foot thick Dyson sphere when you need a 
mild ice and severe. So to me, uh, that's not um, that's not in the ballpark. So there you go. Okay, hope that helps. Uh, it's so absurd, really, when you get right down to it. They really ought to call it a uh, a Tyson spear rather than a Dyson spear. See what I did there? Um, all right, moving on. Uh, yeah, Tyson spear. I like it. It's clever. I'll even dig it. Uh, okay, so moving on here, our friend Eduardo Enrique. Hello, Eduardo. Good to see you as always. Uh, hey, Bill Wazer, thirteen here. I know who you are, man. We're old friends here. Uh, long time no post, but I never miss a TSL or S, even if I only see it the next day. As an anime fan, I'd like to here we go. Like to raise the point that maybe you do not realize that anime, as all other pop culture follows Sturgeon's law, which is 90% of everything is crap and 10% make it worthwhile. And like for every great movie, there are at least nine bad ones. I won't try to convince you to watch anything, but for every nine Yamatos, crewed by teenage schoolgirls, there's a Zipang, an anime about a modern warship mysteriously transported to World War II during a recon mission, and the crew knowing Japan is better today for having lost it. It has to make a tough call to avoid interfering with history as they desperately search for a way back. And yes, the movie The Final Countdown has a similar premise. And hey, let's not forget the manga Demon Slayer outsold the entirety of Marvel and DC in the last three years. In the battle for pop culture, anime and manga are, and its fans are still on our side, even if one, even if one doesn't partake in it, do, sorry. Uh, and I, and I'll, uh, looking forward to the Moon Astronauts and Colonies animations. Best of luck and my very best regards from Enrique and Ernest. Um, it's, sorry, Eduardo Enrique. So yeah, everything you say is true. Um, everything you say is true. Uh, I probably haven't seen any really great anime. Uh, it's extremely popular and getting more popular. That's all true. Uh, some of the stories are, are incredible. That's all true. And I don't like it. And that's all true. I just don't like it. I don't like the way it looks. I just find it. I just find it to be lazy animation, and I'm not a huge fan of of science fiction animation to begin with, unless it's 3D animation. That's my personal taste. You know, everyone's entitled to an opinion, and you're certainly entitled to disagree with me. Wrong though you may be. Uh, so, that's about all I have to say about that. Um, I don't think anybody's going to ever present me with anime that I like in the same way that that you can play uh, uh, hip-hop music for, you can play the, you can say to somebody who doesn't like rap, hey man, you've never heard any great rap, here's some great hip-hop, and maybe it is great, and maybe it's much better than what the person heard, but they may not like hip-hop. And the reverse is true for classical music, so I just don't like it. I just, I just, I just don't like the style. I find it, I find it weird, alien, and all that other stuff. Uh, your mileage may vary. And in fact, I'm sure it does. Uh, let's see. Okay, we've got a couple of Eric Blakes. Uh, hey, Bill. As we all appreciated the John Cleese revelation last time, the fates have given us similar news for this week. Our beloved D. Snyder has not followed the lead of Paul Stanley to cave into the woke mod. In fact, he deemed such behavior worthless and weak and proclaimed it's better to go, we're not going to take it anymore. Yeah, the tide is turning. It really is. It's it's not even the tide is turning. Oh, dear. Well, that's what he looks like today. It's like it's not bad, I guess. It just looks like somebody took Twisted Sister and ran him through the... It's like Twisted Sister got on board the uh, that ship from Planet of the Apes, and we went on a long journey, and, and his uh, hibernation cube cracked. Um, but good for him, man. I mean, he looks he looks good. I can't see his eyes because he's wearing reflector sunglasses. But, yes, that's definitely, uh, that's definitely him with a haircut. And I don't know if he said it's worthless and weak, but my God, that would be for the win. Just coming out and 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 saying something other than the um, you know the official thing is impressive. And um, and I uh, and I I I I remember when I first saw Twisted Sister. Twisted Sister, and they're cheap electric twangers, I thought, man, I don't know. I don't know. But I like the music, actually. 
thought it was pretty cool. And then I saw the video, and then I realized, no, this is genius. Um, oh, what was the name? Michael something or other. Okay, I played Niedermeyer. It's fantastic. Um, first time I ever saw David Bowie. <laughs> I'm a little embarrassed to admit this. Uh, I saw David Bowie on like the Midnight Special or. Don Kirshner's rock concert or one of these midnight on the weekend kind of shows back when you had to all watch the same thing at the same time. And he was doing Space Oddity, I think, and he came out like dressed like a butterfly and he had the makeup on and, and the hair and everything. And he sang, um, he sang Major Tom. And I wanted to beat him with a baseball bat uh, because he was... Um, He was make he, he he was he was trying to over fabulousize Steely Ad Missilemen and I didn't appreciate it. Uh, since then, um, I've come to really really like his music and admire him, especially his later stuff. I know most people think about that the other way around, but Let's Dance I thought was just a great album, and 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 Bowie on camera is great. And the more I got to see of him the more I began to realize this whole thing is just kind of a nudge in the ribs and, and I just didn't get it. I just took it seriously. I was, I think he was trolling everybody basically. Um, and it worked. And so was, uh, so was Dee Snyder. And so was Gene Simmons. And so were the rest of all these outrageous guys that had people completely outraged. And, and that's why we've heard of them. Um, Dave Big Booty says back then he was the anti Brian, uh, Setzer. I'm glad you mentioned Brian Setzer. Um, I, if, if, I've never watched his show. I've seen a, a couple clips of him. But if, if Brian Setzer were a conservative, I would seriously consider changing my position. Seriously consider it. That is a disturbing freaking guy. And that, that smile, it's an ultimate soy smile, and it just is freaking, it's just freaking weird. It's like, you know, this is what happens when you when you take a guy like that and you put him and you put him in, um, you know, a, a, a room and you drain all the blood out of him and, and, and fill his his veins with soy milk. And and, you know, and 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 ugh, he's just disturbing looking. He's just a dis Brian Setzer's got the guy. Brian Setzer's the kind of guy who looks like if you if you pushed him in the face. Just not hard, just with a finger. It, the, it, like it would leave like a big dimple, like the like the Pillsbury Doughboy, you know? It'd just be like, do, 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 look, on him. touch him like this, and the handprint would stay there for like 15 minutes. Um, oh, I'm, am I thinking of the wrong? Did I get it wrong? Are we talking about the, the guy from Stray Cats? I don't know. Falcon Heavy launched a Tesla playing David Bowie, and David Bowie also played Tesla in the Prestige. How about that? Did not know that. Well done. Am I thinking of the Stray Cats guy? I'm Brian. I, I meant to say Brian Stelter. Okay, we know who I'm talking about. We know who I'm talking about. Brian Stelter. Sorry, Brian Setzer. Stray Cats guy is wicked cool. I love that sound. I love it. Um, Brian Setzer. My bad. Completely wrong. I'll, I'll hope that people stay with it long enough for them to realize we all know who I'm talking about. Uh, uh, no, Brian. Uh, Stray Cats. Brian. Let's just put it this way. Stray Cats Brian is a, is a cool dude, and his music was awesome, and I love the Stray Cats, and I love that. Was that kind of rockabilly kind of thing? Um, yeah. Uh, Stray Cats Strut is a great song, and Rock This Town's a great song, and I'm sorry I got them mixed up. I didn't mean to do that. But we all know who I'm talking about. Um, when I Once I said this, you all knew who I meant. Uh, what a... Honestly, it's like, it's like you could, you, you remember those, uh, most of you don't remember them. I never used one. I just seen them. You know, those, those, what do they call those? Um, what are they? Strainers? No. Back before there were dryers, clothes dryers, you would take like a blanket or something and you'd run it through the rollers and you'd crank it. It would squeeze the water out of them, right? What were those things Presses, I don't know, roll, I don't know. But you know what I'm talking about. The old mechanical thing, you just run them through there and ringer. Thank you, the ringer. Thank you very much. The ringer, of course. The ringer. And it looks to me like if you put one of Brian um, 
Selter's uh, fingers in the ringer, Stelter, and, and just put a little pinky in the ringer and just cranked it, um, you'd end up with a vat of estrogen big enough to, to treat every woman in America for the rest of their lives, you know, in terms of, and, and have some left over. He, he looks like an ad for the dangers of, of low testosterone. Uh, he's just, he's just a, 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 and, and he also benefits from having a personality that is perfect for his look. They're just perfect for each other. He is, you look at Brian Stelter and you think, my God, what this guy must think. And then you listen to him and you realize, my God, he thinks exactly what he looks like he would think. And hopefully I do too. Um, and hopefully they're not the same thing. Uh, Brian Stelter. <laughs> Good Lord. Um, he's a long way from Brian Stetzer, all right, that's for sure. He's, uh, he's the, he's the, he's the, one is the, one is the Brian and the other is the anti-Brian. They're like, they're like um, negative particles of each other. It's like, you know, you ever get him in the same room? Is Brian Stelter, Brian Stetzer moving backward in time? Hard to say. Uh, but I know that um, I wouldn't want to be there in the same room because, you know, Stray Cats, Brian would say, you know, you know, look at me once, look at me twice, look at me again, and there's going to be a fight. And the other Brian would go, I'm out of here. <laughs> <laughs> some things you can't unthink. I need some mind bleach. All right, what else we got here? Uh, let's get through this. Let's just move some mail here for change. I'm glad to hear that D. Snyder did not get on the, the woke wagon um, because that wagon not going anywhere oh hey, hey well it's good to know eric uh blake with some more good news bill uh more connected to my end last wednesday S disney's senior vp and chief diversity officer latondra newton okay announced that she is leaving her position read she got the boot as fox business was sure to add after years of progressive controversies now this isn't quite a full victory, no news as far as I know about the fate of the exec who went on about the not-so-secret agenda, but I'll wager the fact that her essential boss has been respectfully dismissed is a pretty good start. Iger won't dare publicly admit he's conceding, but he's certainly beginning to. What say you? Well, if um, if Latondra Newton has hit the road, then I think, uh, I think we can call that a, a, a Doolittle Raid level victory, you know? Um, meaning its total effect is pretty nearly net zero, but its psychological effect is war changing. If the Doolittle raid hadn't happened, Yamamoto wouldn't have gone to Midway with four carriers. He would have waited another couple of weeks and gone with six, and that would have been a different war. But um, let's think about this for a second. I think, you know, I've, I've thought this many times and I've been wrong about this some, uh, on, on several occasions, although I never admit it because uh, I never actually come out and say so, but there are times, been several times when I thought the tide was turning and, and, and tide of turning is a little more like a, a little more optimistic than I want. I really do think that the leftward swing of the pendulum has, has pretty much stopped and it, it, I'm not saying it's rushing back toward us, but I kind of get the sense that it's stopped and it's starting to creep back. Um, I'm finding more and more people have had enough of this, that, they, that they've just had enough of it. And I'm not talking about conservatives. I'm talking about, you know, um, those people. Uh, I heard a new term today, which filled me with joy. Um, I heard a trans person talking about cis gay men. Stay with me on this. Cis gay men? Yeah, that makes sense. Sure, yeah, that's right. So cis gay men would be non-transsexual men who are attracted to other men. In other words, gay men. But they're not gay men anymore because women who become trans men who are also attracted to men are then 
also gay. So for the first time ever today, it's a little milestone on the, on the road out of hell. First time ever today, I heard a trans person referring to a gay person as a cis person. And this, this is where uh, the tale will be told. The tale will be told not because of the conservative uh, or even the normal people, uh, meaning conservative, normal people, you know, progressive. Um, this is where this is where they're gonna. This is gonna be their Waterloo. And it's not it's not an accident. The the left the the philosophies of the left are so inherently illogical and anti-truthful, they're not just wrong, they're anti-truth, that, that as sooner or later reality, the great wrecking ball of reality has to catch up with them, and now it's catching up with them, and what's catching up with them is, is that the, the, the trans movement has taken all of their, not that so much their core beliefs as their core motivations, their core assumptions, their core, yeah, core assumptions, probably best term, and they are running it to its inevitable, if not logical, conclusion. Um, and so the left is, is now suddenly realizing, is the left is splitting up into two camps, the sane left and the insane left. And the sane left is just wrong. The insane left is wrong and crazy. But wrong people can, can be educated. You can, you can change your mind. I, I changed my mind. I ejected from my previous position. That's why I named my blog what I did. So you can change your mind. But you can't fix stupid. You can educate somebody, but you can't fix stupid. And there are some people who are so emotionally committed to this wishful, magical thinking that they'll never change. That's fine. But large numbers of people who had called themselves liberals or progressives are off the train now, and they're not coming back. And, and much in the same way that if I'm the president of Ukraine, I'm very, very happy to see Prigozhin marching on Moscow to conf to uh, to confront Putin because if I'm in a war with somebody and that somebody splits up into two factions and those factions go to war against each other, I'm just going to sit back, keep my mouth shut, and let them do as much damage to each other as they possibly can while I sit here and catch my breath. And that kind of civil war amongst our um, political opponents, I almost said enemies, but I, I really don't want to get into that level of rhetoric. I don't consider them enemies. I just consider them wrong. This civil war that they are, that they have well entered and, and that will continue and accelerate um, is, uh, is going to be, is going to be uh, the end of them. And, and it's not like this is an accident. It's inevitable. It, it didn't have to happen here, but it had to happen somewhere. Um, so, uh, and uh, Dong Jiangui, sure, why not, in the uh, YouTube stream says Alex Jones was right. Well, he's certainly right about some things. Even before Alex Jones was vindicated on a lot of things, I remember, well, 10 years before COVID, I said, think about Alex Jones is that he's right one out of five times. And when he's right one out of five times, he's right so far ahead of the curve that it's astonishing. Problem with him is that he's wrong four out of five times. Um, and uh, and Dong here, Dong Jingwei says, Alex Jones was right, okay, arguable. Glory to Putin, glory to Mother Russia. Well, I'm married to a woman who, um, who comes from Mother Russia. And um, Putin is not covering them with glory. Uh, Putin has destroyed whatever glory there was in, this, in, in Russia. He's taken a, a military that was feared for 80 years and turned it into a laughingstock. And, um, and uh, to say he's well-liked, there's no question it's true that Putin has a lot of support from, from people, in, including my mother-in-law, who genuinely believes that uh, Ukraine was about to invade Russia. And along comes uh, Prigozhin, who says, no, it's all a lie. It didn't happen. Um, and uh, yeah. Steve Oop says Russia's GDP would say, well, it's remarkable, really, if you think about it, that Russia does not is not in the top 10 economies in the world. So as far as covering them in glory, uh, Dong, if I can call you Dong, because it's got a nice ring to it for you. Um, it's that uh, he has, 
he has the Soviet Union, the the the, the Russian people in the Soviet Union have have been surrounded by so many outside forces for so long that their natural character is paranoia and distrust and, and you can't really blame them for that. But the problem with that is, is that they stay inside their psychological cage and their cave is a better word because where bears live and they stay in the psychological cave and they never come out. And so, and so what they do is they, they refuse to come out and and become part of the the party that's going on outside and and they they glorify their own isolation and their own superiority complex which is predicated on a much 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 bigger inferiority complex you look at the history of the soviet union and all of their achievements all of their achievements were reverse engineer achievements all of their achievements were taking existing Western technology and trying to make the world's biggest dam or the world's largest airplane or the world's first man into space. And they did the thing. They did it with the first man into space. Um, and all of that. And and they will throw people's lives at something. If, if America has the technology to have a nuclear sub, they are determined to steal that technology and then build a, a, a poor man's version of it and if that means killing 40, 50 people like they did on their first nuclear sub, then that's the price you pay to get nuclear submarines if you're in Soviet Union. Now, however, now see, this is the thing. Dong is onto something here, and I'm not being facetious here. He's absolutely right. He's really, and this is the, this is the thing about, about the world as it exists now, because as I say, I'm married to a Russian woman, and there's a lot about Russia that I loved before I met her that I still love about Russia, and there are a lot of things I didn't like and still don't like about Russia, but Dong here says something that is really actually right on point. And I'm not being facetious here. He said, well, they don't have drag shows and pride parades, that's for sure. And that is actually a really profound comment and explains a lot of the support for Putin here in the United States, especially among conservatives. Russia is doing the same thing that Russia has always done. It's bluffing its way into catastrophe. It had convinced the West that it was the match for the West. We never really had a chance to put these weapons up against each other. We did it by proxy several times. In the Vietnam War, we had American planes flying against uh, Soviet serviced air missiles. And in the Afghan War, they had Russian helicopters flying against American surface to air missiles. But we've never really gone head to head with, with them. We've never seen, since World War II, never seen their attempt to match our technology and see how it actually performs. For example, the um, Su-57 Felon is supposed to be their, their um, Raptor killer. It's supposed to be their stealth, you know, sixth generation airplane. It's garbage. It's hot garbage. It's advanced for a Soviet jet, but it's, it's stealth. It's actual stealth signature. It's radar cross sections, about that of a clean F-18 or something like that. It's, it's not, it, it's vaporware. It looks like the Raptor, but it's not. And and you could switch the airplanes and pilots, and if you put American pilots in the Felon and Russian pilots in the Raptor, the Felon would win. Because it's not just about the hardware, it's about the training, and they don't train. So, so all that the Ukraine war has done for Putin is make him even more of a pariah, has made Europe arm up, it's brought Scandinavia in terms of um, Sweden and Norway into NATO, and the main thing it's done is not going to be visible for another four or five years. But what it has done is it has Putin has turned, has has set in motion a chain of events that is going to make the single great military power in Europe is going to be Poland. It's going to be Poland because Poland, unlike Russia, is not in the cave. Poland is out playing with the winners, and so Poland saw what happened to Ukraine and. Poland's had, had a lot to complain about from Russia and from Ukraine and from Germany. Poland has been at a bad, bad, bad corner of the world in terms of the 20th century. And so Poland is sitting there watching this and Poland is thinking, hmm, well, we used to be part of the Warsaw Pact. And I know that because it's called the Warsaw Pact and Warsaw is in Poland. We're no longer on this uh, road. Um, and so Poland when, after the invasion of Ukraine, the second one, the current one, Poland basically came to America and said, we want to buy everything you got. We're, we're going to pay cash for it because they have an economy. And um, 
And we said, well, okay, well, we got this. Well, we, we want this many HIMARS. Well, we don't, we don't know how many. So Poland, um, uh, Unlimited Hornet Works just says, don't forget Poland. We're talking about Poland for about just as much time as it goes to ping and come back again. Uh, so Poland says, well, we'd like to have them now because we're going to need them probably in a few years. So Poland has bought all this stuff from Korea and all the rest of it. And... Um, and Lord Bio says, I'm concerned that this maneuver by Russia will give China enough wiggle room to become a real problem. Again, it's insane to underestimate people, and especially in military affairs, and I will never, ever do that. I've just seen enough enough upsets in history through people who, on the powerful side, just took things out of this. No, that, 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 that radar blip that we see off there off the coast of Hawaii, now those are pro almost certain. Those are B-17s. we got B-17s coming in. Well, they're not the right place on it right there. Yeah, but 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 we're expecting B-17s. That's just, it's just a glitch. Just turn, don't even worry about it. I see this all the time. But the problem is, is I mean, the, the, the good news is, is that China is crippled by being China, and Russia's crippled by being Russia. They're both cave countries, and they they have they make threatening sounds, and they build stuff that looks nasty and doesn't work. They took the Admiral Kuznetsov, I can never pronounce that word, you'd think I'd be able to by now. Um, uh, Brew Daddy says this is my show, but it sounds like politics. This is kind of politics, but we're talking about optics and we're talking about projections, so we'll make it, a, we'll make it about that. We'll make it a kind of a, a showbiz look at politics. So, uh, so... They've got their stuff. They promote their stuff as equal to or better than the Western stuff. And as long as they don't actually put it up against Western stuff, they can maintain that illusion. And then that happens, and then it's game over, man. Game over. Uh, Anthony, Bill Whittle, the U.S. lost the Vietnam War. No, Anthony, the U.S. won the Vietnam War. The U.S. lost the Vietnam peace. The Vietnam War was fought because of a North Vietnamese communist incursion into South Vietnam, and the objective of the war was to put the communist invaders back above the border, back into North Vietnam. And when we left that country, that's exactly what we did. A year and a half later, uh, Congress decides to renege on our obligations to South uh, Vietnam, and North Vietnam started poking, poking, poking. And when nothing happened, they just poked until they took the rest of the country. So we certainly lost the peace, no question about that. But I, I think it bears mentioning also that we lost the short-term peace. We won the war. We lost the short-term peace badly. And now we've won the long-term peace because now Vietnam, after all the damage that was done, all of the people that were killed, all the Vietnamese that were killed, all the Americans that were killed, the French, all of it, in order to preserve communism, communism's gone from Vietnam. Vietnam is a manufacturing center now. Manufacturing. Now, they, now I buy stuff from, tar I, I go to Target and, and I find that things like, T-shirts are not made in China anymore. They're made in Vietnam. And they're doing everything they can to um, to catch up. And so the whole thing was kind of like, you know, you could have just, you could have just figured this out earlier, but you didn't, you know. You had to go invade South Vietnam the way North Korea goes and invades South Korea because they're, because they're cave countries. They're, they're cave dwellers. They, they don't, they can't compete and so they won't. They don't change. They could change, you know. They could just change. If I see somebody doing something better than I'm doing consistently, doing better than something I'm doing, I've got a choice. I can either dig my heels in and do more of what I'm doing and just try to pout it out, or I can have the common sense, not to mention the, the strength of character, to say, well, I'm getting my clock cleaned here by people who I think I can beat, and, um, and I'm not beating them. They're beating me, and they're beating me badly. So it's time for me to either reevaluate my position or continue to lose or give up. So I'm going to going to reconsider my strategy. That's exactly what Japan did. Japan was a stone age backwards nation and then they suddenly decided they didn't want to be, so late in the 1800s and early 1900s, Japan looked around and said, "Well, we've got junks, we've got ships that are made out of, you know, bamboo and we've got mats for sails and we're going up against British and American and French and Dutch steel, steam-powered battleships, and we ain't going to win this fight. So they just said, all right, let's get ourselves into some Western uniforms, and we'll build some Western-type uh, ships, 
and they work very hard. They're very hardworking people, extraordinarily strong sense of dedication, and they built themselves the best Navy in the world, by far, by far, in, in, in 1941, not even close. And, and then they thought that just because they had the hardware, they also had the software, and that's where they made their mistake. They were, they were uh, Japan, Imperial Japan, from the, um, from the restoration up until uh, their surrender, was a cave country that came out into the sunlight to buy some stuff and then went back into the cave again because that's what they were. They were not playing with, they weren't playing with the rest of the world. You know, every time you wonder, uh, you're on the wrong side or the right side of this giant debate, you know, is what if Russia's right? What if China's right? What if the communists are right? What, 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 what? It's like, well, okay, let's put it all on the table and just stand back, you know? The communists invaded South Korea from North Korea. The communists invaded South Vietnam from North Vietnam. They started those conflicts. The communists invaded Hungary because Hungary was acting up and making the rest of Europe look bad the same way that South Korea and South Vietnam were making them look bad. The communists invaded Prague. The communists invaded Warsaw. The communists invaded Cuba. The communists did all of these things. What, what are they trying to cover up? And, and why is it that no one ever got shot crossing the Berlin Wall to get into East Germany? And, and why is China locking up people who don't follow the, if, if their system is so great, then why, then why are they suppressing dissent? And by the way, that's not limited to, um, that's not limited to China. You can ask that question of America now, thank you very much, Democrats and, and leftists and, and, and model train workers in the tech industry, right? If you're so sure about your being right, and if you're so confident in things like the vaccine and the election, then why are you canceling and shutting up people who disagree with you? It should be I don't want to, I don't have to cancel somebody who thinks that the moon landing is fake. I don't have to because I'm right and I can win this argument because truth is on my side. And if I wasn't, then I would want them to shut up. So there you go. You know, it's just that simple. I don't worry about them because they're wrong. We're not perfect by any means, but we try to be. And I think our, our goals are, are what the, the country we want to be and always strive to be is as close to as close to heaven on earth as you possibly gonna get, I think. And and other people just don't play ball, you know. Um I think you call it capitalism and all the rest of it. The uh it's not capitalism. It's it's freedom. It's a free market. I and I own something. I work hard. Yes, you work hard. Yes. So here's here's your food pellet for the day. Fantastic. Congratulations. Thank you. Now, if I work harder, in other words, if I get off the factory at six and I go home and do another four hours worth of work and get up two hours early before I have to be at the factory, do another two hours worth of work. Do I get an extra food pellet for that? If the answer is yes, then you will unleash the creativity and the hard work of people. If the answer is no, then there's no reason to stay up later and get up earlier. Might as well just get your vodka and sit back and watch a TV that catches fire. And, and there you go. So it's not hard, really. It's actually not hard. Uh, Dave Big Booty says, speaking of which one will your moon landing show be out on Fox Biz Channel? It might be Fox Nation, by the way. I get all the Foxes confused because I never watch any of them. Um, the West is not the world Policemen, women, we need to look after our own countries. Well, we look after our own countries because we're trading countries, Anthony. We are a trading nation, and and the West is all about trade. Trade is how you create wealth. Wealth creation is accomplished through trade. I've got something you don't have. You've got something I don't have. There's thousands of what I've got back home. There's thousands of what you've got back home. But if we trade them, we're both richer. We both benefit. That's what trade does. And America's a trading power. And if we're a trading power, we have to trade with other countries in the world. And if we have to trade with other countries in the world, we need to secure the sea lanes so that pirates and other people don't steal our stuff. It's that simple, really. The reason I feel confident about America's moral position is because no matter all the criticism that we've taken, and much of it is deserved, nevertheless, we have, how many allies do we have? How many official allies do we have? Just in NATO alone, how many allies do we have? How many, we have bases in something like 150 countries in the world, you know, something like, none of those are there by force. How many, how many military bases does China have outside of China? How many military bases does Russia have outside of Russia? I'm pretty sure the answer is zero, zero. So 
it's the difference between coercion and volition. People want our bases there because they want to protect themselves from the people who want to invade their countries because that's what communists do. And they do that because they can't do anything else because they're not good at stuff. That's why. All right. Mushadar closes with trade with all nations, alliance with none. Well, I think that's sounds great, but it's nuts. Right? It's nuts. Alliance with none. I understand what I understand what, what Jefferson is getting at. Um, we don't look after our own countries. We interfere in every war that doesn't concern us. Stop lying. Well, I'm not lying, Anthony, because if I was lying, I would know that I was wrong and I would be telling you the truth. Now, we don't have to disagree about whether I'm right or not. You're welcome to do that. But lying, I'm not. And when you excuse somebody of lying, that's generally a sign that you're, that you're not real sure about the arguments that you're able to produce. So you know, we just took, take a look at it that way. Is it true we get involved in foreign adventures that we shouldn't get involved with? Absolutely, yes. That's exactly correct, yes. Is it true that we get involved in foreign adventures that we should get involved in? Yes. So there you go. Um, how does it benefit to go fight to the death over Ukraine with Russia? I hear this all the time. I hear this all the time. I've never heard the end of this from the beginning. How, if you support all this stuff, Bill, how can you condemn our guys to go fight and to die in Russia, in, in Ukraine? No one is talking about that. It's never been on the table. It's never on the table. It won't be on the table. This is a proxy war. When we fought in Vietnam, our guys were getting shot down by Soviet surface-to-air missiles. We weren't, we weren't fighting Soviet soldiers. We were fighting Soviet weapons in the hand of somebody else. So the Soviet Union got to bleed us for 11 years with, with weapons and supplied to the, to the North Vietnamese. If the North Vietnamese or the North Koreans hadn't had Soviet weapons, the thing would have been over in a week. But there were no Russian troops that were facing us. They didn't take any casualties in, in those wars. As a matter of fact, thanks to guys like Lyndon Johnson and, and Truman, for that matter, and Eisenhower, we basically fought both of those conflicts with both hands tied behind our back because of the possibility of killing Russian troops. The possibility. We can't hit the Nang. We can't hit that SAM installation. We can't hit it, that air base because we know that there are Russian technicians there. And if we hit that base, we might kill one or two of them. And that could lead to big problems. So we're talking about weapons and we're talking about stopping a force that needs to be stopped. It will have to be stopped somewhere. If you don't stop it in Ukraine, it's going to stop it somewhere else. And that's how it works. If you don't like it, I'm sorry. This is Earth. And, and this idea that we're going to send guys, our, our children, to go die in Ukraine, no one's ever talked about that. Not even Biden is talking about that. He doesn't even know what day it is, right? He doesn't know what day it is. And, and we didn't start this, by the way. You know, we didn't we didn't like we didn't launch like these raids against Russia the way that Germany did just before the invasion of Poland. You know, we didn't we didn't go in there and start blowing up radio stations wearing, you know, Ukrainian outfits to to goad Russia into the war. It's it's just plain. Putin is a is a kleptocracy, is a kleptocrat and he's a communist. And he thought it would be a good idea. And he believed, like all dictators, what he was told, because when you're working for a dictator, you want to make the dictator happy. So he was told it would be a three-day war and all. Okay, so since it's going to be easy, we'll just put the moral stuff aside, and there it is. And, and you've got people that are willing to employ our weaponry and inflict tremendous casualties on somebody who's been our geopolitical enemy for 80 years. In fact, has been our geopolitical enemy since Lenin took over in 1917, so... If we were talking about American troops in Ukraine, I'd be on your side 100%, but they're not. And so I don't understand where this comes from. Um, we don't have to look at ancient history, you know. 1945, there are people alive who remember those days. They remember how Hitler kept going and going and going and going and going. And, oh, well, you know, and then finally we had to stop him. And that was 50 million people killed. Um, yes. DJAC-65, Russian pilots were flying some of the MiGs that attacked our aircraft during the Korean War. Not just some of them, most of them in the beginning. There was one day when we lost a mission, and I want to say we lost something like 19 or 29 B-29s, big, big bombers, were shot down when they were ambushed by MiGs that were flown by Russian pilots. But they weren't wearing any insignias. So this is it, right? The, the, the Afghan war, not our Afghan war, the Russian Afghan war, the Russians lost that war because we supplied them with Stinger missiles, not because we supplied them with Marines. We gave them Stinger missiles. Yes, we gave it to the Mujahideen because they were, at the time, the lesser of two evils. So you can't tell what's going to happen in the future. You can only tell what's happened in the past and try to prevent it in the present. And so I am willing to allow for mistakes. I'm just not so 
so considerate when it comes to making the same mistake again and again and again. And we've done that too, no question, we've done that too. But people point out about how how corrupt Ukraine is and how and how awful they are, and 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 in large degree they're right. They're they're largely right. It it just doesn't matter. Um, Anthony says, we've had so many terrorist attacks in England because of our wars in Iraq and Afghanistan that had nothing to do with us, and we brought the terrorists to our door. This argument um, is also, uh, this argument assumes that we started it. And this is also the argument that says that we can't, um, we, if we bomb Hitler, then Hitler's going to get really mad at us. Uh, I don't buy it. I don't. I don't buy it. Um, the uh, when when you say things like this, what you're really doing is you're saying that those people have no agency, right? That that terrorists aren't even really people. They don't have their own agenda. They don't have their own objectives. They don't have their own strategy. They don't have their own desires. They don't have their own greed. They don't have their own ambition. None of that. They're just a a, a ping. They're just an echo of us and our intentions. So when we're nice to them, they're nice to us. And when we're mean to them, they're mean to us. And it's all about us. They don't even exist. They're just essentially just a kind of a reflection of us in everything we do. And that's, and that's it. I love this question. I've been waiting for this. The Americans did not want to get involved in World War II because they said World War II had nothing to do with them. They only entered World War II at the end of the war. Well, if you want to call 1941 the end of the war uh, that started in 39 and ended in 45, I'll check your math on that one. But you can, you can certainly say that we got late to the European war. But the reason we have a United States of America was because we're getting goddamn tired of fighting in wars in Europe all the time. This country is not just settled by British people. We had large numbers of German people here as well. All of this, yes, we relate to World War I and we relate to World War II for the same reason that a policeman is late at the scene of the crime because he didn't commit the murder, right? That's it. I'm sorry. I'm sorry that Europe is, is, is the bloodiest place on the face of the earth. And, and yes, we were slow getting over there, but we had to go because Europe couldn't stop. They just couldn't stop, couldn't stop themselves, can't stop themselves. So there you go. We were late to defending Great Britain. I'm half British, by the way. I should point that out just so you know, 50% British. And I love England, and I love Great Britain very much, very much. But to say that Britain caused World War II because because of the because Germany didn't like them is, I just think that's wrong on the face of it. And to say that we should have been there at the beginning, fighting by Britain's side in a war that was a European war, when if you think about it, prior to World War One. That was the last people we really fought was Britain. We fought them in the Revolutionary War, fought them in the War of 1812. They damn near entered the Civil War on the side of the Confederacy. So this whole thing about, oh, you Americans were late, it's like we're just sitting there eating popcorn, watching, you know, watching something that we started while you guys fight it out. No, no. We, we left Europe to get away from this kind of nonsense. Left it. And that's why we came here. And eventually, you managed to make such a mess of things over there that we had to get involved because now the whole world's going to burn because Europe is the birthplace of the West. That's it. Um, Dave Olson says, check that bill. The bloodiest patch of ground in the world is China. Yeah, maybe. There's more, there's more artillery ammunition iron in the world is in France, I'd say, but anyway. World War II was caused in part by the punitive damages of the Treaty of Versailles, correct. And the punitive damages of the Treaty of Versailles were being pushed by the British and the French who'd gotten horribly injured. Um, and, and America tried to mitigate that, but didn't work because the Europeans did what they did. So that also got them World War II. Um, here we go. Of course you don't buy it because you live in your own fantasy land. Ready to listen to what part of it's fantasy, uh, Anthony. I didn't answer your your uh, challenge by saying you're an idiot or you don't know what you're talking about. I replied to your challenge by stating some historical facts and figures and arguments. And when you come back and say, oh, well, you just live in fantasy land, that's a sign of a guy who doesn't really have a pretty solid command of either the facts or the history or any of it, really, honestly. I, I, I would say I'd expect it better, but I didn't. Um, so you can do what you want to about that. I, I am staunchly pro-British. I love Great Britain. I think they're the most astonishing people in the world. But this business about we just 
sat there, did nothing because we're mean, is nuts. It's nuts. My mother, my mother was, was in Britain, was in London during the Blitz. She was moved from London out to the countryside when the German bombers came over, and they didn't particularly care much about things like Child Protective Services in those days. So what happened was, this actually happened to my mother. They evacuated London, and they put kids on trains and just shipped them out to the country, and they were picked up by lines of people, and there was no background checks into any of them. They simply were adopted by families outside of London, outside of the bombing area, and that's what actually happened. And my mom and my uncle were unfortunate enough to have been taken in by a couple of psychopaths psychopaths, people who threw knives at them, knocked them unconscious, that kind of psychopath. And the only time my mother ever, ever, ever felt any sympathy or respect or anything other than abject terror on the part of the people that were, that were cooking her pet goose for dinner, honest to God, literally, the only time she ever felt sympathy for that woman was when that woman came in the door one night and, was, and had tears in her eyes and said, it's going to be all right now. America's finally in the war. America's in the war on our side. That's the only time she ever felt any sympathy towards this woman. It's the only time that woman ever expressed an emotion that wasn't like, I'm ready to kill you. Yeah, America's in it now, so, so we can sleep now. Now, now. now we'll be okay. So I know how many guys we've sent over to Europe and died on European soil. I got a pretty good idea of the number. I don't know how many Brits came over to America to fight on our side or anywhere else. Now, I, let me take that last sentence back. Let me take that back. That's not what I meant to say. Britain has been with us from, from certainly from the beginning of the 20th century. We have been standing together like the best friends we are. We are absolutely, absolutely unique. It is the most unique alliance in history. And when I say Britain, I don't just mean England. I mean Canada and Australia. All of them together. Look, Great Britain has three kids, Australia, Canada, and the United States, culturally. I should say that it has two kids and a half and a step kid, because we're the step kid. Canada and Australia, pretty much British on both sides. We're British on one half, just like me. And the other half is a mix of a bunch of other things, right? But there it is. And and I, I have heard this argument so many times from Brits saying, well, you guys were so late. You sat out the, we sat out the war to the end of the war? Really? Well, you can tell that to the guys who went ashore on, on D-Day because we went ashore on Utah Beach and Omaha Beach. The British and the Canadians went ashore on Gold and Juneau Beaches. And most of those were relatively simple, but uh, Omaha Beach was not fun at all and we didn't go to omaha beach to protect fucking cleveland right that's not why we went to omaha beach we didn't do it to protect cleveland we did it to protect london that's why we got those guys killed over there and it was the right thing to do don't misunderstand me but this business well you guys just sit back and and cause the whole thing get get lost man you want to talk about a fantasy land we'll see who's living in a fantasy land so Strangely turned enough into a uh, political show, but I guess everything is politics these days. I'm kind of done. Gold, Sword, and Juno, thank I forgot about Sword Beach. Um, so, there you go. Um, I'm done. I'm tired. I want to go home. Uh, yeah, we ended it. That's how it worked. That's how it works. Uh, and that's not fun. North Africa and Italy, of course. And, and... While the defeat of Germany was probably 70% due to the Russians, we and Britain had a lot to do with that. But on the other side of the world, we beat Japan by ourselves at the same time. And Britain wasn't helping us in the Pacific. They just weren't there. They weren't there because they they just didn't have the strength to be there. I'm not blaming them for not being there, but if you want to play this game about sitting out the war, uh, we can get a lot of help from the, uh, from the British in the Pacific. We did that on our own while we were doing Normandy as well. So there you go. But of course, 
this fantasy land that I live in is predicated on historical fact and undoubtedly doesn't measure up to your uh, academic standards. So we'll just leave that one alone. I dare you to stand the wall with me one day in the military. Do you? Do you? I'll take that dare. I'll definitely take that dare. Absolutely, I'll take it. That doesn't intimidate me. You want to you want to start this um this keyboard warrior thing with me? That's fine too. That doesn't intimidate me. All right, I, I'm not afraid of this, at all. Not at all. This doesn't this doesn't this doesn't intimidate me in the slightest. Yeah, well, if you want to do it, then you should go fight. I'm perfectly prepared to fight. Perfectly prepared. I have been my whole life. So you're not going to get me with that. You're not going to make me back down. You're not going to make me feel guilty. You're not going to make me do any of those things, period. No, not with me. It doesn't work that way. Uh-uh. All right, I'm done. Um, show's made possible by the members at BillWhittle.com who uh, keep us going with this thing. Uh, go volunteer in Ukraine, then. They'd love to have you. Well, here's the thing, Longinius. I'm not interested in voluntary in Ukraine because I'm not promoting that for anybody else. But they are taking my tax money to use our weapons in Ukraine, and I'm in favor of that. So since that's what we're talking about, since we're talking about weaponry, I think I'm paying for the for the weapons. So that's my contribution to a war that we're not actually in as a country. That's my contribution. Yeah. Miserable lowlifes. What a, what a pathetic, sad argument that is what a what a six-year-old argument that is honestly really i love australia i love canada love britain love them all they're great i'm just tired of being slandered without without pushing back and that's what i do all right so that'll do it for the show um we will see you guys on thursday for the stratosphere lounge where undoubtedly we'll talk about making movies that's how things work strangely enough and until then uh You know, do the, uh, you know, do the, um, the, uh, the thing. <laughs>